Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to especially thank Joe for that very kind introduction. I want to thank NDN. More importantly, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists who are here with us and people who really devote a lot of their time in thinking about Latin American issues, certainly Nora, who's always a great friend, but more importantly, how we work together constantly in, in debating many of these issues. And I'm sure, you know, unfortunately, I cannot stay. I would love to, to hear some of her take on this. And of course, Pablo Sotero, who is this great journalist and Anytime anybody wants to get current on Brazil, should be speaking to him and the rest of the panel. Anyways, thank you all. And let me begin by saying that, you know, this is a, we're really living in a very interesting time and, a, and truly a, a time of opportunity. As the U.S. elections results in November really offered a clear and, and, and robust mandate for a new president to face some of the more difficult challenges and with energy and resolution, which is what's going to be needed uh, coming forward next year. And I think it's also important for the next U.S. administration and its allies in the Congress to begin to understand so many of the complexities of the political economy and the economic policy being developed in the region and not to be blinded by old stereotypes that too often color relations between the United States and Latin America. Our region is really looking forward to working closely with the Obama administration and both the people and the governments in Latin America are impressed by the leadership demonstrated so far by Mr. Obama. I think this opens an enormous window of opportunity for cooperation and development between all of the countries in our hemisphere. Latin American economies are 60% bigger in real terms than they were 10 years ago. And they also show significant improvements in their macroeconomic performance. The average annual rate of GDP growth across the region between 2002 and 2007, as all, you, all of you know, was over 5.5%, the highest registered in a five-year period in the last quarter century. And this healthy growth has also taken place against a backdrop of relatively low inflation, about almost short of 7% on average, 6.86%, and responsible for macroeconomic policies in many of the region's nations which now boasts considerable current account and budget surpluses. Foreign borrowing in Latin America amounts today to 22% of the region's output, exactly half the percentage that we had in 2002. And by 2007, foreign reserves had been stockpiled by, that had been stockpiled by the region's governments added up to around $460 billion up from 165 billion just in 2002. Not surprisingly, the private sector in many of these countries has also registered very strong growth. In some of the Ford, Forbes listings of largest global corporations, 20 come from Brazil, 20 come from Mexico, and about 10 from Chile. And if that doesn't sound too impressive, bear in mind that in India and in China, each claim about 30 companies. And if not long ago it was seen as an exception uh, and a novelty for Latin American companies to be listed in New York, shares of about almost 40 Brazilian companies and about 20 Mexican corporations now trade on the U.S. exchange. Beyond all of these figures, the political environment shows significant improvements. This progress is reflected in the deepening roots of democracy in much of the continent. And it isn't simply a matter of holding elections but it's also the strengthening of the rule of law in many of the countries in the region. You see it in many countries where governments act responsibly, where you see a more vibrant built civil society backed by more independent judiciaries. The progress isn't the same in all countries, but the trend has been positive. And if there's anything one can say today is that Latin America has become increasingly more heterogeneous. Too often in Washington, people ask, you know, what's going on in Latin America as a question. And the hemisphere is treated perhaps in a simply a sports arena kind of metaphor and trying to be faced off against a monolithic right on the one hand, with the ensuing score providing a shorthand for whether Washington should be alarmed or content. This audience knows better how simplistic and almost caricature-like is this view, but I'm afraid that it is one that is too, of, too often prevalent in this, uh, certainly around the Bellway. And it's a type of gross generalization that is not employed to analyze political developments in other parts of the world. 
Part of the Latin American complexity is that each country, understandably, is playing out its own history. Brazil and Chile, for example, among others in the region, exemplify a new model of responsible governments that are balancing their progressive social agendas with prudent fiscal policies, constructive relations with Washington, and a respect for the rule of law. It is no accident, therefore, that these are the ones best prepared to weather the financial storm. The fact that South America's largest country is now in a period in which parties from the left and the right can peacefully alternate in power without major drama is part of the good news out of the region, perhaps the best of times indeed. At the same time, Latin America faces both immediate and long-term challenges. In the first instance, the unfolding global financial crisis is threatening the achievements of the last decade and some initial wishful thinking and that perhaps, as Joe was saying, that we could have decoupled. Well, the reality is that we are recoupled or relinked from the problems uh, that today are fa being faced by both Europe and the US. The current crisis is slashing the region's income as commodity prices plummet in response to slumping global demand. The price of oil, as we all know, has dropped significantly from its summertime peak. Copper has retreated back to prices of close to late 2006 or January of 2007. Soybean prices are down by over 40% from their peak last February, and so on. Meanwhile, as global credit tightens, large companies that have enjoyed access to external financing must now turn to domestic markets for funding. This combined with the demands of governments facing sudden budget short shortfalls could crowd small and medium-sized businesses out of credit markets, depriving these engines of growth of needed capital. Moreover, Latin America and the Caribbean face the other problems originated far away from the region. First, local currencies are under important stress and domestic policies to maintain the exchange rate are suffering from tensions abroad. The banking system, even if in a better position than in other regions, may suffer from contagion as foreign financial institutions have a large presence in the region, increasing its exposure to the crisis as these banks could start to repatriate capitals to their home countries. Also, Latin America is exposed to the crowding out effect of debt proliferation. As developed economies are likely to largely issue debt for the public expenditure and the whole fiscal stimulus in countercycle policies, Latin American countries will have to upgrade the interest rate of their own debt bonds. Then there are the long-term challenges facing the region, which have been the focus at the IDB. Even when the economic headlines were all positive, there was reason to question whether the gains we sh were shared widely enough and to worry about the sustainability of the region's development. So the bank, which will be 50 years in 2009, is trying to be nimble and innovative in broadening and deepening the region's development. We have programs that focus not just on building new schools, but on improving the quality of education in existing schools. We're backing alternative energy projects that are environmentally sound and don't crowd out food production. We have launched what we call the Opportunities for the Majority Initiative to provide financing to private sector companies that deliver quality, affordable products to low-income consumers, what typically is known in the literature about inclusive growth. These issues of long-term sustainable development must be a central concern of the next U.S. administration as well. President-elect Obama is being greeted with tremendous goodwill around the globe. His charisma and openness towards different perspectives, as for instance, Europeans or Latin Americans' views, is highly appreciated. Nevertheless, he and his team will need to be mindful that they will be presiding over a financial crisis that is affecting the livelihoods of millions of people in developing countries that for once had no role in triggering this crisis. In contrast to the financial crisis of past decades, this global contagion started here and it spread to emerging markets that had gotten their houses to a large extent in order to avoid future shocks. Countries like Mexico or Brazil or Colombia have taken many responsible strides in, in recent years, living with their, within their means, but this credit crunch born in the USA is still pressuring their currencies and severely hurting their markets. No need to engage in the blame game, but it's important that the next administration 
appreciate how this crisis is affecting other countries. All stakeholders in the global economy have a vested interest in embracing concerted action to minimize the damage of this financial contagion. But in this case, there is also a political need for Washington to be sensitive and empathetic in the case of Latin American countries. No matter where Latin America ranks on the list of US priorities, the region will present the Obama administration with very important challenges. The imminent or ongoing Cuban transition or succession, the regulation of migratory flows within the hemisphere, the quest for more secure energy supplies, and finally, the need to reform free trade in a way that deepens rather than weakens existing covenants while assuming domestic and political concerns. As it is often the case, these challenges each provide an opportunity. The Cuba debate is well beyond the scope of these comments, but it strikes me as an opportunity for Washington to show a new willingness to deal with such challenges in a multilateral manner. On immigration, the reform that has been presented in, in Washington, but it remains an urgent issue, and I hope that in a new spirit of pragmatism, will emerge, will emerge to reconcile the labor needs of developed economies with the development interests of exporting countries in a matter that respects the human rights and need, dignity of migrants. Globally, the flow of cross-border migration increased by 240% between 1970 and 2005, but in the same period, the volume of trading goods and services increased sevenfold. Some 5% of all Latin Americans live outside the region. As economic migrants, sending home close to over $70 billion in remittances a year, while raising concerns about a costly brain drain from their own countries. The trend towards temporary worker agreements between countries could provide the necessary solution to advance the interests of both North and South. Washington's focus on energy matters, which looks to intensify in the coming years, could be the catalyst to raise Latin America's profile among policymakers here. Latin American stature as a reliable oil and energy supplier to the U.S. speaks for itself, and there will be opportunities to explore ways to expand that. An even greater opportunity, however, may lie in a long-term partnership to develop alternative energy sources. Indeed, as the world moves to embrace non-corn-based non biofuels, Brazil could be in the time to supplant Saudi Arabia as an important energy partner. The broader trade agenda will also prove a delicate challenge, as well as an opportunity. The WTO talks to further liberalize trade have stalled, and there is little enthusiasm for new regional or bilateral trade pacts, and there's also growing skepticism about the benefits of globalization, both here and in developing nations. And this is a major problem that could dramatically aggravate the economic slowdown. Tough times can't be used as a pretext to deny the interdependence between nations or the economic reality that the more nations exchange goods and services, the better off they tend to be. Trade and foreigners always make tempting political targets in downtimes, but responsible leaders must not stop to that temptation. Protectionism is not the answer to legitimate legitimatize anxieties about globalization, which the U.S. government can and should address by negotiating human rights, labor, and environmental conditions in trade agreements and in trade expansion. And I'm also happy to see that in the G20 communique, the whole trade issue was really brought to the forefront. We'd like to close by noting that there is ample historical precedent for those of us who are optimists by nature. Back in the 30s, Franklin Roosevelt became president during a dire economic crisis. And he turned this nation's back on fear, not only on fear itself, as he put it, but on fear of further engagement with the outside world. For Latin America, that meant the, new, the good neighbor policy and an era of harmonious relations. Then in 1960, a young Democrat took office in what was considered a historic milestone in this country, the first Catholic to become president. Like Barack Obama, Kennedy didn't have a wealth of experience in government, but he inspired hope for a political renewal. Also, like Barack Obama, it wasn't clear how much attention Kennedy would be able to devote to Latin America, given how distracted he would be
by pressing, by pressing crises elsewhere. And yet it was in his administration where the Alliance of Progress was launched, still remembered fondly throughout the region. I believe that Latin America is ready to engage in a mature alliance with Washington, a true partnership that is mutually beneficial as the hemisphere navigates these uncertain and turbulent times. Thank you very much. Marcela. Thank you. Uh, Marcela Sanchez, I'm a columnist here in Washington. I wanted to ask President Moreno, uh, this famous flight to quality, I think that is being called, have you had a chance or have you been able to hear how much are we talking about in, in regards to Latin America, how much money is already leaving the region? And what can the bank do to counter that situation? How much do you have to offer? Well, Marcela, it's hard to, I mean, I, I haven't seen any hard numbers of what's the, let's call it the flight capital out of Latin America to the United States. I, uh, and, and I think you, for, for, for one to get a, a true handle on this, you probably would have to do it country by country. Um, but one of the interesting things is that when you talk to people in, in to bankers in, in, in many different Latin American countries, you almost saw like for a time, I don't know that's still there, a reverse flight to quality as Wall Street entered into all the problems that we all know, people who had uh, for historically uh, old family fortunes in U.S. banks moved them back to Latin America and basically told from what I'm here and I uh, have no uh, deep uh, analysis on this other than, than what you talk to bankers and you know bankers love to talk. Um, basically how people were bringing back money and saying just keep it simple put it in very safe kind of paper and so you go to countries like panama which has a big banking center and you'll see that you see some of the countries that have a you know age act offices in in, uh, in the u.s uh, from latin american banks so you saw that trend as well so i think it, it's working both ways the net effect i don't know what it is uh, right now i wish i knew I'm Celine from the Spanish Newswire EFE. Um, on Monday, it's a crucial day for Ecuador. Um, perhaps it can must suspend payments, or what do you think would be the reaction of Latin America and the U.S. Uh, if that really occurs? Look, I don't want to talk about a hypothetical. You can imagine this is a complex issue. I just wait and see what happens, and then we'll comment. Uh, this is Nestor Iqueda from the Associated Press. A follow up on that question. And uh, the uh, Ecuadorian president said that part of the debt that is going to be ignored is uh, or belongs to the international or multilateral uh, institutions. And uh, what, is, what would be the reaction for the IDB if part of the debt is not recognized by the government? Well, I don't, as far as I know, uh, and everything that we've been uh, hearing, uh, certainly IDB uh, loans would not be included in that. So basically, we don't have any kind of cross-default type of uh, uh, clauses here. Well, f first of all, in that regard, we've been doing a lot of reforms in the bank when there was a lot of talk that these uh, institutions were not relevant anymore. And uh, those were the days when, you know, there was plenty of money available uh, and you know the rest of the story. So we began many of these changes and they basically began to be implemented in the bank starting of ju in July of last year. And since that, we you know, continued many of the changes that we need to do. What do they, what are, what are the bulk of those changes? One, the understanding that if you're working in a hemisphere that is so heterogeneous, you must have increasingly more people in the country offices and less people in Washington. And that you need to deploy technical people to the, to the country offices. 
Second, the way we operate. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we used to have uh, many different units in the bank. What we did is we basically work in a matrix system, which is the way most uh, financial institutions work today. And by the way, that's one of the reforms the World Bank did with a lot of success. So we basically went there. We're, of course, now looking at, at risk products. We're working on you know, a capital adequacy model, a new operational framework. And certainly, vis-a-vis -vis this crisis, what we're doing is we're topping up our lending as much as we can for 2009. Uh, we also created you know, one of the first impacts that we saw in the region were issues, as you would only imagine, around liquidity. And one of our main concerns is to try to help in whatever way we could to to have a liquidity facility. We created a liquidity facility of $6 billion, but not, we knew that that wasn't enough. So we led an effort with other institutions and the World Bank joined in, the Fondo Latinoamericano de Reservas, uh, the CAF, and we're working with others in this regard. We are hoping uh, uh, to work with other governments to find ways where we can uh, you know, get funds directed at specific needs, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, for infrastructure. Sam knows this very well. I mean, infrastructure lending is going to be a, a major issue. And one of the interesting things is that, yes, there is a huge gap in infrastructure investment in Latin America, but certainly the best way, and perhaps one of the very f uh, central ways for many countries uh, uh, to do any kind of fiscal stimulus. So we're hoping to see how we can help and support those projects like we have been doing it and perhaps uh, working and partnering with other organizations. My name is Ricardo Castillo. I'm a student here at the George Washington University. You mentioned that there is an opportunity for a renewed alliance between the region and, and the US, but the rhetoric of some Latin American presidents doesn't seem to help several times. You foresee that there is a real opportunity for a regional alliance or? Well, I, I think there's certainly an opportunity for a positive agenda. I think this is a, a hemisphere today that is far more mature. Uh, yes, there is, you know, diversity there. There is a, a, it's very heterogeneous, as I said at the beginning. Uh, and I think that's the challenge. But I think that's very much a, a situation in many parts of the world. And I think uh, if there was a, ever was an opportunity to work uh, in a, in a multilateral way uh, is this one. I, I think uh, it's very hard for, for the U.S. At, in this juncture to go it alone. On the contrary, it needs partners. Uh, and there's many partners in Latin America. Look at the case of Haiti. Um, here is a country that uh, is our little piece of Africa in the midst of Latin America. And it's been really Latin American countries that, you know, come up to the table and began to uh, not only be part of the MINUSTA, which is the UN uh, force, but also to really do things uh, in whatever way they can uh, in Latin America. We've made a huge effort as well to provide grants to Haiti. Uh, and it is things like this uh, where I think uh, cooperation is going to be the name of the game. I'd like to thank you, Ambassador, um, for your presentation. Great. Thank you.